Hey, good morning, everybody. It's Russ Barkley. I finally woke up. It's Saturday. Sorry I'm a little late posting this, but it took me a little while to get out of the nursing home today. So hope you appreciate that. But here I am with your dad jokes for this Saturday before we do our research review. These dad jokes come to us from the website keeplaughingforever.com. My thanks to them. Here we go. They rank these as their best. I think they're onto something here, so pay attention. First one up, I saw an ad that said, radio for sale, $2, volume stuck on full. I thought to myself, I can't turn that down. <laughs> These are very clever, by the way. Someone glued my deck of cards together. I don't know how to deal with it. Don't you love that one? All right, here's another one. <clears throat> A little sexual innuendo here, but... I tripped over my wife's bra. It appeared to be a booby trap. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to use that with my partner or not. Finally, for my birthday, my children gave me an alarm clock that sweared at me instead of buzzing. It was quite a rude awakening. <laughs> okay, there's plenty more over there at keeplaughingforever.com. Let's move on now with our research review. I got four really good articles for you uh, this morning. Hope you enjoy them. And first up comes to us from the journal Brain and Development, and it is a review of all MRI studies in patients with ADHD. In case you're not familiar with that acronym, MRI is Magnetic Resonance, Im excuse me, Magnetic Resonance Imaging. Uh, and it deals with brain structure, brain functioning, uh, what is known as tensor imaging, which has to do with diffusion into white matter. And they can measure the circuitry of the brain, the white matter circuits that way and how they're functioning. Some of the MRIs were done based on task performance while the person was in the machine. Others were resting state. They review all of them. I thought I would just summarize the results for you because it's quite, <clears throat> excuse me, illuminating when you figure out that people say, oh, ADHD doesn't exist or ADHD isn't a disorder. Well, here you go. Here's what we see across all the studies on brain structure and functioning in ADHD. First of all, <clears throat> the initial structural MRI studies revealed reduced gray matter volumes in regions implicated in executive functioning. Who would have thought? Yeah, isn't that great? Particularly the frontal cortex, the basal ganglia, and the cerebellum. So we've talked about those structures many, many times before as being interconnected and involved in ADHD. There was also evidence of delayed cortical maturation during development in children and teens with ADHD. Then it looked at diffusion, excuse me, diffusion tensor imaging. This is a way of looking at how water diffuses into cells in the brain, and it can determine the functional and structural integrity of the white matter tracts, not the gray matter on the outside, but the fibers that actually connect throughout these different brain regions. And it could, gives an incredibly detailed analysis of these white fiber bundles. And what did that find? Findings highlighted abnormalities in white matter integrity, particularly, again, in the frontal striatal cerebellar circuits and their connections between the corpus callosum and the cingulum. You can look those up. I don't have time to show your brain this morning, but that is very consistent with my earlier conclusions about the role of neuroanatomy and neural functioning in ADHD in early videos. They then found that task functional MRI studies, looking at how the brain functions during task performance, demonstrated reduced activation of brain networks involved in cognitive control, which is executive functioning, timing, we've talked about problems with time before, and reward processing. Now, we've talked about motivational deficits in ADHD, and these studies seem to verify that underlying brain structures related to reward and motivation are involved in ADHD. And these included the frontal striatal and frontal parietal networks. Finally, 
resting state fMRI, which just looks at the person as they rest, they're not doing any tasks in the machine, showed altered patterns of connectivity within and between key brain networks, including the frontal parietal network, the default mode network. I've talked about that before. That's the network related to daydreaming and mind wandering and the salience networks. Those are networks that uh, inject, if you will, valence, meaning, motivation, importance into stimuli that the brain is processing. All of those are implicated in ADHD. The latter might explain some of the attentional problems because they're not, that is, the stimuli you're attending to don't seem to have as salient an impact on the brain as they do in neurotypicals. So a great review there of all of the research on brain, uh, excuse me, on MRI studies over at the journal Brain and Development. Now, my next study, let me get rid of that, my next study comes to us from the Journal of Psychopathology and Clinical Science. This is a meta-analysis of cognitive endophenotypes in ADHD. What does that mean? They're looking at patterns of task performance on cognitive measures, particularly executive functioning measures, in people with ADHD, their unaffected family members, and healthy controls. Why we want to look at this? Because if ADHD is largely genetic, then the genetic liability may extend to first-degree relatives, or even first- and second-degree relatives, where we would expect to see some of the signs of ADHD in them, even if they don't have all the symptoms and full disorder. They may still show some of the deficiencies in cognitive functioning. And speaking as someone who has ADHD in their family, including my fraternal twin brother, Ron, uh, since deceased, but what you might see, as I've noticed in our family members, is little bits of the phenotype appearing in the relatives of people who may have full disorder. So let's take a look at what they found. And in this study, which looked at 229 different measures across different studies of functioning, they found that the unaffected, that is undiagnosed, first-degree relatives of individuals with ADHD perform significantly worse <clears throat> than the non-ADHD control group in working memory, processing speed, and response time variability. We've talked about this before. One of the best tasks for assessing ADHD, if we're going to use a task, is reaction time variability. And they found that in the relatives as well. They also found problems with temporal processing, which is sense of time measures, and in cognitive flexibility. They didn't find any differences in measures of inhibition, arousal, motor functioning, planning, or delay aversion. So this study sort of suggests that there is this larger phenotype out there within families of people with ADHD, such that genetically related first degree relatives show some symptoms and signs, at least on these cognitive measures, of the same disorder. So think of it as kind of an iceberg, and underneath the surface is the variability in the genetic phenotype in these families. And then above the surface, the smaller peak, that's the diagnosed people with ADHD. So uh, this is, a, I think, an incredibly important study in showing what earlier single studies had suggested, and that is that first-degree relatives share some of the same cognitive deficits as do family members with full ADHD. All right, we're going to move along now, take a look at an article that comes to us from the Journal of Affective Disorders. I found this very interesting. I don't know quite why they took a look at this, but I'm glad they did, because this is a large Canadian study that followed couples over time and then looked at the relationship between ADHD and experiences of depression and anxiety in the postpartum period in both mothers and fathers. So they're going to look at some interactions here that I thought were pretty interesting. The study involved 
2,500 couples followed over time into the period when the parents had a child born to them and during that postpartum period up to two years after the child was born. And what did they find? Interestingly enough, compared to mothers without ADHD, they found that those with ADHD had higher odds of experiencing depression and anxiety, as well as their comorbidity of both. They were 70% more likely to experience those problems with depression and anxiety than were the non-affected mothers. Maternal ADHD symptoms were associated with anxiety in the father. Whether or not the father had ADHD doesn't seem to matter here. So it was a very small increase, but given the size of the sample, still statistically significant. So suggesting that mother's ADHD and her other difficulties might lead to father's of that woman being a bit more anxious during the postpartum period. Vice versa, let's take a look. When they compared fathers without ADHD, they found that those fathers also had higher rates of depression, 2.3 times higher than the typical males. And they also were twice as likely to experience anxiety as well as the comorbidity of anxiety and depression. So during the comorbid period, the fathers with ADHD were even more likely than the mothers to experience anxiety and depression. They also found that ADHD symptoms that were associated with the father were predictive of depression in the mothers. Now, that's a small increase in risk. Again, it's significant, but quite small. Nevertheless, it's suggesting that just as we saw earlier, that if one parent has ADHD and may have anxiety and depression after the birth of a child, that may impact the other member of the couple as well. So what an incredibly fascinating study I found that to be. And that's over at the Journal of Affective Disorders. As always, I put the links to these articles in the description for this video. Last up is a dissertation. Now, ordinarily, I do not cover unpublished research. But this is so important, and it echoes a theme that you've heard me talk about repeatedly in these research reviews and other videos on the need for researchers studying the impact of various family factors on risk for ADHD to control for the genetics of the disorder, that is the family risk for ADHD in the parents because where you might find that an adverse event or even a dietary event, like I talked about last week, where Western diets appeared to be associated more with risk for ADHD and offspring, but that could simply be a marker that one or both parents have ADHD. The diet or the other risk factor you're looking at, like adverse events, is just a marker for ADHD. It's not a cause of ADHD, but you don't know that until you remove the substantial genetic loading for the disorder. I cannot harp on this enough. I covered it yesterday in my video on what was wrong with Erica Commissar's views on ADHD and Diary of a CEO. I've covered it earlier in talking about Matei's work on ADHD. <clears throat> that is his hypothesis in his book, Scattered Minds. So we're going to take a look at this because this doctoral student, her name is Alexandra Kanina at the Karolinska, in Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden, for her research, did a genetically informed design looking at whether or not social or family adversity and adverse life events during pregnancy increase the risk for ADHD and autism spectrum disorder, and then controlled for the history of the disorder in the parents. And what did she find? She found that on the first pass analysis, yes, there was a relationship between psychosocial adversity in the family during the first year of life and the child being at risk for autism or ADHD. But then when she went back and controlled for the family relatedness 
of these individuals with other family members who had the disorder, the findings went away, suggesting that the initial findings were due to familial confounding of the disorder with the measure of psychosocial adversity. She went on to look at adverse life events during pregnancy and autism, as well as repeated adverse life events and diagnosis of autism in the children. She found the same thing, that the initial relationship, relationships between adverse life events and increasing risk for autism disappeared when you controlled for the family history of the same disorder. And although she didn't look at ADHD in those separate studies or analyses, I'll bet you she would have found exactly the same thing. So here demonstrates the point that I've been making earlier, that it is very important to control for the family genetic history of the disorder before making conclusions about what might or might not be an environmental risk factor for ADHD and autism spectrum. Because oftentimes what you think is a risk factor is simply a marker that the parents and other relatives have that same disorder. And that's what's causing the adversity, the adverse life events, and so on. So a very important dissertation there, uh, and that's why I wanted to cover it for you. All right, everybody, that's it for this morning. Sorry I was running a little late, but I had other videos to do, like that one that I just posted on the short animated video explaining ADHD from a child's point of view. Very cute, but very well done video. All right, thanks for joining me, folks. As always, if you're not a subscriber, think about subscribing. And if you are, and you know others who might benefit from the content on my channel, suggest the channel to them. I would deeply appreciate that. Not because I need the subscribers, but we're trying to get the word out. I'm trying to pay it forward here before I get to the end of my own life. And it's very important to me that we continue to advocate for science-based awareness of ADHD. All right. Thanks again. As always, live well, be well. Take care. Bye for now.